Okay, we move on now to the two categories of highway pavement. Actually, there are two categories of highway pavement. We have the rigid pavement and the flexible pavement. So, when we talk about flexible pavement, it can be defined as a pavement layer comprising of a mixture of aggregates and bitumen which is heated and mixed properly and then laid and compacted on a bed of granular layer. So, basically, for our... Uh, flexible pavement this is usually consists of bituminous surface underlaid with a layer of granular material and a layer of a suitable mixture of coarse and fine materials so we have to take note that the traffic loads are transferred by the wearing surface to the underlying supporting material through the interlocking of aggregates so the frictional effect of granular materials and cohesion of fine materials so when you talk about uh, flexible pavement it is actually subdivided in through uh, three subgroups so we have the high high type or intermediate type and the low type so when you talk about high type pavement uh, it has the wearing surfaces that has adequately support the expected traffic load without visible distress due to fatigue and are not susceptible to weather conditions. And for our intermediate type pavement, they have a wearing surfaces that ranges from surface treated to those with qualities just below that of high type pavement. And the last one, which has the low type pavement, these are usually uh, a low cost road and have wearing surfaces that range from untreated to loose natural materials to surface treated earth. So we have here, what are the structural components of flexible pavement? So the structural components of a flexible pavement, you have the illustration, the schematic diagram is showing to us the structural components of a flexible pavement so on the bottom part you have the subgrade then followed by sub base then you have the base course then you have the surface so the surface then for our subgrade actually which has it is actually the natural material located along the horizontal alignment of the pavement and services as the foundation of the pavement structure. So if you're going to observe our subgrade is located at the bottom. Actually, that is also known as prepared road bed. So that is the bottom part of our uh, structure for our flexible pavement. Then we have the sub base. So we have the sub base course, which is located immediately above the subgrade. So for this one, the sub-base sub component consists of material of a superior quality which is generally used for subgrade construction. So, so actually the, mater the requirements as, uh, for the sub-base sub material is actually they are, in, they are being assessed in terms of gradation, plastic characteristic, and strength. Then we have the base cores. So the base course, if you're going to observe in our figure, it lies immediately above the sub-base. So it is placed immediately above the subgrade if a sub-course is not used. So there will be instances wherein the, the base course is placed immediately after the subgrade if they will not be using a sub-base material. So this course, actually the base course consists of granular materials such as crushed stone, crushed or uncrushed slug, crushed or uncrushed gravel and sand. So the specification for base course materials usually include more strict requirements than those for sub-base materials, particularly with respect to their plasticity, gradation, and strength. Then we have the surface course. So if the surface course, of course, is the upper course of the road pavement and is constructed immediately above the base course. So the surface course is flexible pavement, usually consists of a mixture of mineral aggregates and asphalt. So the, space, the surface course now is the flexible pavement, which is that is now a material, which is a combination of a 
uh, mineral aggregate and asphalt. It should be capable of withstanding high tire pressures, resisting abrasive forces due to traffic, providing a skid-resistant driving surface and preventing the penetration of surface water into the underlying layers. Then we move on to so so stabilization. Of course, you have to take note that not all soil or not all locations, in particular the soil, is not suited for a certain type of structure. So which means that there is what we do we have to improve the soil so the soil or we have to stabilize the soil. So it is actually soil stabilization is actually the treatment of natural soils to improve its engineering properties. So that we have to improve the engineering properties in order that the soil will be fitted to a particular structure. So we have a soil stabilization method. So it actually, the stabilization method is divided into categories. We have the mechanical stabilization and the chemical stabilization. If you speak of mechanical stabilization, it is the blending of different grades of soil to obtain a required grade, while chemical stabilization is the blending of the natural soil with chemical agent. So actually for our uh, stabilization, so we have what we call uh, cement stabilized soil, we have the soil element, we, we have what we call cement modified soil. We have another one which is plastic soil cement and we have the soil lime, uh, which is those are some of the uh, agents that is used to stabilize the soil. So for stabilize, uh, cement stabilization, uh, actually, it involves the addition of 5 to 14 percent of port, uh, Portland cement by volume of the compacted mixture to the soil being stabilized. And for our, uh, we have this what we call uh, soil cement. The soil cement actually is a hardened material obtained by mechanically compacting a mixture of finely crushed soil water and quantity of Portland cement that will make the mixture meet certain durability requirements. Then we have the cement modified soil. It is a semi-hardened or unhardened mixture of water, Portland cement, and finely crushed soil. And we have the plastic soil cement. It is hardened. It is a hardened material obtained by mixing finely crushed soil, Portland cement, and a quantity of water such that at the time of mixing and placing a consistency similar to that of mortar is obtained. And we have the soil lime. The soil lime is a mixture of lime, water, and fine grain soil. So if the soil contains silica and alumina, for example, pozzolanic reaction occurs, which results in the formation of a cementing type material. So what is, uh, so for the flexible pavement design actually, so it is actually the design of flexible pavement wherein the pavement structure is usually considered as a multi-layered elastic system with the material in which layer characterized by certain physical properties which may include the modulus of elasticity, the resilient modulus and the Poisson ratio. So for the design of pavement, we have here methods that is being used. So one is the ASH2 method, wherein it is actually based primarily on the result of the ASH2 road test that was uh, conducted in Ottawa, Illinois. So this one is a, for our uh, ASH2 method, there are the there are design considerations. So the factors considered in the ASH procedure for the design of flexible pavement uh, are the following. So we have here the pavement performance. We have to consider the traffic. We have to consider the road bed soil or the subgrade material. You have to consider the materials of construction. You have to consider the environment, the drainage, and 
reliability. So, which means that it is important for us in the design for flexible pavement, for uh, using the ash to method for the pave, uh, consider the pavement performance. So actually, the primary factor that is being considered under this pavement performance are the structural and functional performance of the pavement. So when we talk about structural performance, actually, it is related to the physical condition of the pavement with respect to factors that have a negative impact on the capability of the pavement to carry a traffic load. So for these factors, this includes actually the cracking, the faulting, and many other factors. For the functional performance, it is actually an indication of how effectively the pavement serves the user. So the main factor considered under functional performance is the riding comfort. So basically that is uh, that is the riding comfort of the user is the main factor that is being considered or be uh, for under functional performance. And of course for our traffic load, so a traffic load for the ash to design method the traffic load is determined in terms of the number of repetitions for in 18 pounds or 18 kilonewtons single axle load applied to the pavement on two sets of dual tires. So that is basically how we uh, determine the traffic load using the ash to the side method. So of course, for our uh, for our Traffic load, so we have here a tabulation showing to us for the different axle load equivalency factors for flexible pavements, single axle. So we have here the axle load and the pavement structural number or the SN. So we have